Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm well, Wendy Green, and I wanted to thank the Southeastern Critical Care Summit for the opportunity to talk about intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment syndrome, and I do not have any disclosures. Let's take the first case. We have a 67-year-old female who presents to the emergency department with a history of liver disease. Unfortunately, here at 5T South, in my ICU, we see a lot of liver disease. This person came in with new onset pleurisy, dyspnea, and agitation. Hypotensive, despite IV fluid resuscitation, they've now become intubated, and we've got them sedated and comfortable. Unfortunately, they, become, they start to worsen over the next four to six hours. They become difficult to ventilate. The alarms are going off. Everybody's running in the room. Could you stop the alarms from going on and off? They become hypoxic, hypercarbic, hypotensive, and their urine output, of course, is zero. We check their intra-abdominal pressures. They're 45. We go ahead and get an abdominal ultrasound, and it shows ascites. What is your next diagnostic or next management step? I'll give you a moment to think about it, and here we go. This person has tense ascites. What is the treatment? A paracentesis. Let's get that fluid off. Let's try to remove that extra pressure. We have a problem and we can treat it. We take off 4,500 cc's and the pressures go down to 14. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief and there's immediate resolution. The renal status, pulmonary, and hemodynamic compromise resolves. Everybody feels good about this though. Let's take this next case. We have a 77-year-old male who aspirated on the general medicine floor, transferred to the MICU, and was intubated and hypotensive. Lots of fluid resuscitation. They're very surgy. Now, they're on levofed. They're in Nurex. What are your next steps? Let's get an ultrasound, KUV, and do an intra-abdominal pressure measurement. The ultrasound, it shows no free acidic fluid. The first case, there wasn't a lot of acidic fluid to go after. This one, there isn't. Now we find the KUV. It's massively distended, large and small bowel. Intra-abdominal pressures are 31. What is this diagnosis? And what are your next steps in management? All right, let's move on. It's an ileus. Large and small bowel dilatation. No evidence of obstruction. So the surgery team is consulted. I'm very happy to come and take your consult. <laughs> and, uh, and you say, well, uh, Dr. Green, could you please decompress this person? I, I need a, a decompressive lateral rod. And I was like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Before we do that, let's see if we can try an NG tube decompression, some rectal tube decompression, some oral cathartic. Let's see if we can get some of this air and gas out of there. One hour later, the intra abdominal pressure goes down to 12, the urine output increases, and the norepinephrine is discontinued. We know that if we open this patient up and give them an open abdomen, there are a lot of complications that can occur. It's not as benign a process as you might think. And some of those of you who've seen an intracutaneous or atmospheric fistula, you know. So what is intra-abdominal pressure? It is the pressure within the abdominal cavity. And how do you measure it accurately? Make sure that this person has no abdominal muscle contraction. That means paralysis. You want to check at the end of expiration that the patient is supine and the transducer is zeroed appropriately. This is a measurement with a Foley catheter in there. You instill 25 ml of sterile saline, and you're very happy to see that the pressure should be somewhere between 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. We also need to grade these so we can communicate how severe this intra-abdominal, how high this intra-abdominal pressure is. Is it a one to four system, one being 12 to 15, greater than 25 is a four. Now, when we have greater than 12 and we have intra-abdominal uh, pressure, we can grade them also, whether it's a hyperacute because you laugh and push real quickly or because it's chronic and because you're pregnant and you've got this intra-abdominal pressure or somewhere in between, which is what we deal with, the acute and subacute population. Now, when that intra-abdominal pressure is elevated to the point that it affects the organ, this, or causes organ dysfunction, greater than 20 millimeters of mercury, plus or minus abdominal pressure, ab abdominal perfusion pressures that are less than 60, then that would be abdominal compartment syndrome. 
If you think about it in the brain, we have cerebral perfusion pressure, and we realize that you can use the mean arterial pressure minus the intra-abdominal per pressure to get your abdominal uh, perfusion pressure, and we want to perfuse our organs. When we think about classifying abdominal compartment syndrome, we think about primary and secondary causes. Primary being a primary intra-abdominal process versus secondary is coming from massive fluid resuscitation in some of our patients. And this will affect every system in the body. Decreased cardiac output, increased systemic vascular resistance, reduced chest wall compliance and tidal volume, resulting in hypoxemia and hypercarbia. We'll have renal vein compression, which res results in decreased venous return, <coughs> decreased mesenteric blood flow, impaired ability to remove lactic acid, and elevated intracranial pressure. Every organ is affected. So when you have decreased perfusion, decreased preload, you'll have decreased cardiac output, reduced blood flow to the organs, and you'll end up with multi-system organ failure. So what do we do? Supportive management would be neuromuscular blockade, ventilator support, hemodynamic support, and look for surgical decompression. Whether it's a percutaneous drain to remove that fluid like we did in the first case, a decompressive celiotomy, and sometimes we just have to go to the bedside and open up the abdomen. And if there were sutures in there before, to cut them and put in a temporary uh, wound back closure to allow for that fluid removal and expansion and release of the pressure. So there is a society, the World Association uh, for Abdominal Compartment Syndrome. Can you believe that there's a society for this? Yeah. There is. And they have said that we, there are no recommendations as far as diuretics. People think, oh, so we should diuretic these people off and that'll make them better. They couldn't give direct recommendations for that. What about renal replacement therapy? No, no recommendations for that either. And a hemodynamically stable patient who has, um, who has intra-abdominal hypertension and a, a acute resuscitation has been completed and the inciting issues have been controlled. So what are some pearls to leave with? Trauma is not required for abdominal compartment syndrome to develop. It can occur in any unit, and the measurement is helpful, but don't wait to the last minute. Spot checks are often erroneous because you wait too long, and if you uh, wait too long, it becomes an urgent problem, uh, it changes an emergent problem, urgent problem to an emergent problem. And intra-abdominal pressure monitoring will allow early detection and early intervention for intra-abdominal hypertension. Thank you very much.